Good evening and welcome to Arizona Illustrated for Thursday, the 4th of October, 2012. I'm Tony Paniagua. It has been a year since the Occupy movements made headlines around the world. And here in Tucson, supporters are getting ready for their anniversary on the weekend of October 13th and 14th. However, even though the effort may be out of sight and out of mind for millions of people, Occupy participants are still meeting every Wednesday night in downtown Tucson, where they tackle multiple topics during their general assemblies. It's a weekday night in downtown Tucson, and much of the indoor activity here is happening in well-lit office buildings or other structures. While outside, most people are in transition, traveling from one point to another in the comfort of their cars. However, with little more than the light from a few computers, cell phones, or Mother Nature above, a group of activists is embarking on a very different type of journey. This one requires you to be stationary for a while, even though it's part of a movement that has attracted like-minded people around the world. I just posted something also on YouTube with Mary's 9-11. Uh, they are supporters of Occupy Tucson, but instead of colonizing parks with tents and sleeping bags, many arrive on bicycles and just take a seat for a while, putting democracy to work. Was there any other working group reports, David? The participants come from different backgrounds and experiences, but they share some common concerns. Well, I think the thing that we're learning and the thing that the message that's been trying to get through to the country as a whole for the longest time is it's not what officials you elect that are going to change the world around you. It's the actions that you make in your own world. Um, I've been gone for quite a while now, actually. I've been to Occupy San Diego, Occupy LA, Occupy Chicago, Occupy Memphis, Occupy Wall Street. Just to let everybody know the movement isn't dead. I've been to all across the country, and it's just as much happening right now as it was a year ago. And their worries cover a broad spectrum, from global warming and health care to the financial crisis and military interventions overseas. In my personal preference, if I were king or tsar or something, is that we would shut down every military base that is not within the continental United States and bring all of our people, not all of our soldiers, but just all of our people home. That we would shut down every foreign corporation that has any involvement. Just pull out. Just pull out. And bring our resources home and stop all this overseas meddling because that's where our money is going. That's all I got. With the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court and the bailout of the banks and the economic crash, it's been a corporate coup d'etat. We need to reverse it. The, con the country is up for sale. It's got to stop. We're not going to live too long without water, and the rich people may have it longer than we do, but they're going to need it too. You know, it's crazy. It's suicide what we're doing, and the earth is sacred. Is there a solution? What can be done? It has to be done on all fronts, and we do have to change our energy policy. We have already know that we're past the tipping point, that we're going to experience climate change for quite a while. It's not just Occupy Tucson. We're occupying a planet. We're sharing it with every other living being. You know, equality for all and justice. When you have that, the ecological balance, you know, we can all just live in harmony and, and not go extinct. So it's kind of a big thing for me. I would like us to live. The scene looks very different from the movement in 2011 when tens of thousands of people turned out to different public spaces around the world. Tucson was no exception and police arrested many of the activists for trespassing. Still, groups such as this one remain committed one year later. And I do it by coming into the office during the week and to coming to GAs and to going to meetings where we discuss things and where we plan things. That's how we do it, and it's going to take a long time. So are you finding that enough people care about these issues? Oh, yeah, because I'm on Facebook and Twitter uh, daily, and my, uh, my, um, my readership base is uh, growing on a daily basis. So, and, uh, and it isn't just uh, people here, it's people worldwide. And here in southern Arizona, they are doing their part. While most other people are busy and oblivious to these gatherings nearby, these activists occupy their minds with serious issues and a fervent desire to affect change.
an organization that is dedicated to increasing awareness, conservation, education, and research about the indigenous people of the American continents is celebrating its 75th anniversary. The Amarin Foundation is located near Wilcox, Arizona, and it is holding a series of seminars this month to commemorate this major milestone. Here is more about the foundation. It was designed specifically to house Mr. Fulton's collection and make them open to the public. The museum itself wasn't open to the general public until uh, the middle 80s. Before that, it was open by appointment only. He came out here from Connecticut. Uh, anthropology, archaeology was a big hobby of his. That was, he was not a trained archaeologist. That was a fascination of his uh, ever since he was uh, a young man traveling out to the West and finding interesting artifacts. He moved out here with the family, built this wonderful museum and uh, house that's up on the hill here. Started the museum itself, uh, started with just his private collection. The museum itself, the foundation, undertook a lot of excavations around the region here um, and all over um, southern Arizona and into northern Mexico. Um, the signature project that the Amarin Foundation undertook was the Joint Casas Grandes project, and that was in uh, Chihuahua, Mexico, um, just about uh, a four-hour drive southeast of here, and that was a uh, 13th century archaeological site and complex that was a three-year project. It's mostly as a resource and to fo help foster research in the, in the field of anthropology and archaeology in the, the, U the southwest United States as well as northwest Mexico. And it's not just confined to that region either. The, the focus of the museum here is actually hemispheric, so it's the Western Hemisphere. As you'll see in this room here, some of the artifacts uh, you'll see from Alaska all the way into uh, Central and South America. Well, in here, I'm rather fond of the Casas Grandes uh, ceramics. Um, the, the ceramics really were one of, the, one of the great pieces of art from that culture and actually influenced some uh, contemporary ceramic production in Chihuahua in the village of Mato Ortiz that's down there. Well, the buildings here were, were built not long after the, the foundation was started, so you're looking at the, the middle to late 30s for a lot of these buildings. These buildings were designed by a Tucson architect named uh, Merritt Starkweather. Uh, the, the museum itself was built um, as a museum, a lot of folks come here on their first visit and say, oh wow, what a wonderful home this was. And the home is actually up on the hill, and that's the, what we call now our Fulton Seminar House. But the museum itself was built as a museum. It's just a, a place that's full of wondrous treasures from, from around the Western Hemisphere. Everything is just so fascinating. Um, and there are so many wonderful objects that are on display and that are in, um, in our storage um, that I discover something wonderful every day that I didn't notice before that, oh wow, that, that's really fascinating. How did I not notice that wonderful piece before? In celebration of eco-living and sustainability, the Free Earth Harmony Festival is taking place this weekend in Tumacacari, Arizona, which is north of Nogales. Caitlin Harrington has an interview with two festival coordinators. In studio with me now is Mycenae Plyler and Amadon Delerba, both festival coordinators for the upcoming Earth Harmony Festival. Thank you both for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Um, Mycenae, begin with telling us what this festival is all about and when and where it will take place. Sure, um, it's coming up this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, October 6th and 7th. Uh, it's the Earth Harmony Festival that um, is really about um, helping to people to understand um, how to create harmony 
with the earth as well as with each other. It's set at Avalon Organic Gardens in Eco Village, and that is a working eco village and organic farm and garden. And um, so everything that happens there is about creating sustainability and harmony with the earth. And it's a way to really share um, what all that is with people because we feel that that's really needed in what's happening with the world today and the economic times that we're in. Um, really encouraging people to learn to grow their own food and um, have less impact on the earth um, and Mother Nature. <laughs> and Amadon, can you give me a little bit of history on Avalon Gardens and what an eco village is? Sure. <clears throat> Avalon Organic Gardens and Eco Village was started about 23 years ago in Sedona, Arizona by my parents, uh, Gabo Viarancha and Neon Emerson Chase. We started uh, this gardens to really encourage people to start learning about how to live in harmony with nature and have less impact on this earth. And today it has evolved um, into the Earth Harmony Festival, which really encourages people to do all of these things because, as we know, the economy is getting rough and American society uh, really breeds a lot of competition. And we are trying to teach people to come out of the age of competition into the age of cooperation and that we need to live with less impact. And so an eco-village is really an environment where people can come together and do that. And so we are building, uh, doing a lot of green building, alternative building, and we're on land, 165 acres, where we can do that. And so we have, you know, we do carpooling, we do rainwater harvesting, we do gray water harvesting, we grow all of our own organic vegetables, we have dairy products, we have our own animals. And so we're able to create an environment where we're creating our own little micro ecosystem. And it was started in Sedona and has evolved like I said, over the years into this festival, which is the first year we're doing it in Tumacaque, Arizona, on our land, and it's looking really good. We have a lot of campers coming, and we really want to teach people about what it is to live in harmony. And one of, one of those things is that you need leadership. You know, you need leadership to start an eco-village, to start a community. Uh, you, can, you can start one, but to maintain one, to keep one going like we have for 23 years, takes a lot of leadership. And so we want to have people come to our eco-village, be immersed in the environment where they can learn about that and see for themselves. Um, Mycenae, we have about a minute left, mm -hmm. but can you tell us, in addition to being an educational festival where people can learn about eco-living, um, there's a couple other different events that are going on. Can you tell us some of those? Sure. Um, the festival itself will be very fun. I mean, all of this um, is going to be set in a really fun environment. We have a children's village. Um, definitely the children are part of the future and, and we raise them to learn to be really in harmony with the earth. There's a lot of animals on the farm. There'll be pony rides, there'll be um, bunnies and talking parrots and hands-on activities. There'll also be live music by Global Change Music Bands that sing really positive, uplifting songs about all the things that we're talking about. And uh, our eco tours and hayride tours will be taking people around the eco village who really want to learn um, all the different things that Amanon was talking about. And we also have, um, throughout the year, Earth Harmony Sustainability Seminars. So if people can't make it this weekend, they can come throughout the year to one of these seminars and learn all these principles. That, well, the next one's coming up um, on February 7th through the 10th. My Sine and Amadon, thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Thanks, Thanks so for much. having us. Yep. The Broadway hit Avenue Q presents a modern kind of coming-of-age story in a production that uses human and puppet actors side by side to deliver drama, satire, and songs. We'll meet some of those puppets next, along with two of the talented young performers who will bring them to life for a new Arizona Repertory Theater production at the University of Arizona. Here is Mark McLemore. Avenue Q is coming to the Arizona Repertory Theater stage, and joining me now is Michael Calvoni. He's an actor who's starring, and he brought Princeton, the uh, lead from Avenue Q, with him. And we also have Michelle Lane, who's a director of puppetry, who did some instruction and taught the Avenue Q actors how to manipulate their puppets. And she brought a special puppet of hers named Mish Monster. Hi. Hi. It's so nice to have all four of you here with us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Michelle, tell us a little bit about why puppets are important to Avenue Q. Well, gosh, it's like so important, in, in, in particular with this show, because, you know, it it's very similar to South Park. South Park uses the element of children um, out of the mouths of babes and, um, you know, animation. So with, with this particular Broadway show, they added the element of puppetry so that we can bring a lighthearted, funny way of looking at our life and our society and poking fun a little bit 
showing a mirror just ever so slightly to, to just allow people to let their guard down and relax and keep an open mind and, you know, really laugh at ourselves. What are some of the first things that you try to establish with your students when you're teaching them about puppetry? And you actually brought us a, a, a little a tool that you use yep. to instruct that kind of helps them get the idea of what it's like to manipulate a puppet. Yep. But tell us what, what's primary to, in, to impart. Um, there, there, there are a few very basic things that we really um, hone in on, one of which is focus. Um, you know, as you can see with, with Mish Monster, she's looking directly at you. Um, the, the tendency is to relax your hand and just to kind of let it be where it is. So they have to work very hard to really keep focused and maintain contact because when you're not completely focused in, you lose that connection. Um, uh, so focus is huge. Breathing, bringing these characters to life, laughing. <laughs> you know, crying, everything, all these emotions and reactions. So we really, we touch on all that stuff, gravity, how to walk with a puppet. Um, There's so many elements uh, and specifics, and specifically with this show, we work really hard on syncing your movements, everything you just, everything you do to gesture. Um, when you look over, you know, you don't think about this stuff. And when you go to grab a glass of water, you don't just look at the person you're going to and find that glass, you look at it. So we learn to look where we're grabbing. So, you know, oh, is that a, you know, button on your shirt, you know, and you kind of look down and everything is very, very specific. Michael, how has this experience been for you as an actor? Uh, are you and Princeton getting along? <laughs> we are. Uh, yeah, it's definitely been a very unique experience. Um, something that I've never done before, uh, but you know, and it's it's an intense rehearsal process even before that because we have to come in before Michelle comes. We have to learn our music. We have to learn our script. We have to learn everything because, as you can imagine, he takes most of my attention. I can't hold a pencil and my score and my script and everything. So, I mean, uh, yeah, it's been unique. There's there's a lot more to it, as as she's explaining. In that's just the that's just a small part of it too. We go into so much detail. Um, well, show us a demonstration of a couple of moves that you like to do with Princeton. Um, like before you mentioned something about rolling your eyes. Okay, yeah. Uh, so if I roll my eyes um, and I would just tilt his head back. So if I rolled my eyes and did that at the same time, like like that, you would get the impression that Princeton is rolling his eyes. Um, things I also like to do, I like to dance with him, you know, mm -hmm. do just a little puppet dance, uh, which I do in the show. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, and you, I can, you can uh, you know, check his breath or, you know, comb his hair or just do many things that we do. Well, Princeton, I understand you do a lot of singing in the show. Uh, does that come naturally to you? Uh, it does. Uh, I love singing in front of an audience. Um, you know, something I like to do is uh, when I do vibrato, I, I like to just, uh, you know, just do that a little bit, like, ah, uh, just like that. I, uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, but yeah, I love singing in front of an audience. Michelle, you said that Mish Monster was special to you. Can you tell us where you came from, Mish? Um, this puppet comes from Australia. Jared Boucher, um, he designed her to be a hybrid of Kate Monster and me. So when I did the show, um, I fell in love with puppetry so much that I wanted uh, a similar puppet. Well, thank you so much for coming by and spending time with us. And I think it's fun to remember that we all had puppet friends when we were kids. So Mish and Princeton, it was great to meet you. It was great to it meet you. It was great you. to meet you too. Thank you. Thanks. Break a leg. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Gardening is one of the most popular activities and the weather is finally cooling off in southern Arizona after a long hot summer, which means more people will be heading outdoors. Next Saturday, October 13th, you'll be able to see some exemplary plants and landscaping designs thanks to a tour from Master Gardeners here in Pima County. Joining us with the details are Joyce Nill and Annette Everlove. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. We'll begin with you, Annette. What is the Master Gardening Program all about? How does it work? Tony, the, the Master Gardeners are a group of volunteers um, that are under the auspices of the University of Arizona Extension Service. We receive extensive university-provided training. And after our training, we are let loose on the community as an educational outreach and resource um, to such things as schools. We provide ongoing uh, periodic talks at several of the public libraries. 
we man information booths at uh, various farmers market and perhaps one of our most significant and certainly popular services is we run a plant clinic at the University of Arizona Extension Services offices on North Campbell just south of River Road where people can walk in with their plant or they can call. They can also call our satellite office in Green Valley and just to give you an example of how important that service is, you can call about any gardening questions, um, plant health, pests, disease, you name it. Last year, 2011, we had 7,800 inquiries on a walk-in basis or call-in basis. We also maintain uh, several demonstration gardens at the Extension Office's campus and those are open to the public. You can come by during business hours. Thursday morning are our work days, so if you want to come and see the Master Gardeners in action, Thursday morning it's like a hive of bees um, gone loose. And we also um, have a plant sale and what we're here to talk about today, our annual home tour. So let's talk about that home tour, Joyce. Uh, there are going to be four gardens and each one will focus on a different topic. Let's begin with the container gardens. You're right, Tony. This year we have four properties, each with a different focus. And our focus is um, on one of the gardens is a container garden. And it's a remarkable garden. She has um, containers containing um, cactus, succulents, annuals, perennials. Um, she changes some of these out yearly. She's going to be able to provide fertilizing tips, uh, planting tips. She also has um, hanging baskets, which usually do not perform very well here in Tucson. But this particular um, homeowner has done a really fabulous job in her backyard. Okay, and you have uh, fruits, vegetables, and irrigation. Let's talk briefly about each of those, please. All right. Um, the vegetable garden is going to be also very interesting. This is for anyone who wished that they could grow vegetables <laughs> in southern Arizona or perhaps has had a failure. Um, it's also for people who live in condos or townhome, and all they can do is use a container to plant perhaps lettuce or radishes on their patio. But we'll be talking about site selection, irrigation, composting, um, insects, everything at that particular garden. The next garden would be um, a garden that has trees, and they're fruit, they're fruit trees, but they are apricots and peaches and um, also pomegranates and figs as well as citrus and she's growing dwarf and semi-dwarf trees which are perfect for in town and she's growing them in pots and also in ground. She is uh, going to give classes on how to care for, what to look for, and how to actually get fruit off those trees. And then another garden we have is all about irrigation. And this is perfect for the average homeowner who may have some struggles, may not know exactly why they're having problems with their irrigation system. These guys are great. We have two guys who are going to be conducting that class and they're going to, it's all about irrigation, where to buy, what to look for. Okay, well, thank you so much. We'll have some more information on our website for people to find out about the tour that's coming up on Saturday, October 13th. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Now we go to our weekly segment from Damian Klinko, the president of the Tucson Historic Preservation Foundation. Klinko joins us with interesting and educational information about some of the cultural and architectural treasures in this part of the world. Tucked into a quiet neighborhood where Tucson Boulevard ends at the Rito River is a fairy tale garden called Valley of the Moon. The Valley of the Moon, conceived, designed, and built by George Farr Legler between 1923 and 1932, is an expression of the surge in popularity of spiritualism following World War I. The sensation surrounding the sighting and photography of fairies in the United Kingdom, popularity, of fairy tale and fable literature, and the prominence and accessibility of exotic European fantasy architecture in silent cinema in the second and third decades of the 20th century. 
The tale of George Lar Flegler seems derived from fairy tales. His early childhood involves a wicked stepmother, stowaways, and an influential shoemaker. Consumed by legends, spirits, and fairies, he became an inseparable part of his own mythic landscape, which he began to create at the age of 38. A guide, narrator, self-described mountain gnome, and resident of the Enchanted Garden, Legler transformed himself over time into one of the roles of his own fable, a cloaked figure who for years lived in underground caves on the property, surviving on nothing but milk. Despite his reclusive life, he was celebrated as a folk hero in newspapers and magazines, including life. As the 20th century advanced, myths and fairy tales faded in the wake of World War II, the Cultural Re Revolution of the 1960s, and the Vietnam War, and Legler retreated into the crumbling garden. An anachronism of a bygone era, he became a hermit, disappearing into the overgrown grounds unheard of for a decade. In the 1970s, a band of high school students with faded memories of childhood moonlit excursions into the park climbed the fence and found the elderly, frail Legler barely alive. Like Rip Van Winkle awakening from sleep, the students extracted him from the deteriorating terrain and nursed him back to health. Then, the students and the 90-year-old gnome worked together to restore the property. Upon Legler's death, at almost 100, the students inherited a foundation and the responsibility as stewards to guard the garden in perpetuity. In 2010, a National Register nomination was submitted for the Valley of the Moon, which will be decided sometime this year. For times and operation and information regarding tours and special events, please visit valleymoon.info. You can get more news and information on our website, azpm.org. To comment on any story you saw tonight, click on it online and go to the bottom. We could also be reached via Facebook and Twitter. Coming up tomorrow night, Jim Ninsel will join us with the Arizona Illustrated Political Roundtable, where he and his guests will cover some of the top political news in our region. I'm Tony Paniagua from all of us at Arizona Public Media. Have a great night.